Hi, this is Daniela Camboni, and welcome back to the Daniela Camboni Show, where today I am catching up with my good friend, best-selling author, and world-renowned speculator, Mr. Doug Casey, who recently said we're looking at a potential financial and economic co collapse and a social collapse, largely as a result of wokeness. We're going to talk about this, but so much more today. Doug, so good to see you. Thank you for joining me. It's a pleasure. I'm uh, out here on the endless pampas of Uruguay uh, at the moment, where I spend most of the uh, northern winter, which is to say the southern summer. So yeah, well, it's good to be here. Well, well, thank you. Thank you for taking time uh, from your day to sit down with us. I think uh, it's, you know, I, I don't want to say Happy New Year because we're almost into February here, but I think it's still important to touch base with you and kind of set the tone for how Doug Casey thinks uh, 2024 will reveal itself. I mean, you know, just looking at your quote, I don't think it's a good one. And I want to go over, you know, certain news headlines here with you today. But roughly, let's start with an overall sentiment from Doug as to uh, what he sees unfolding here as we start the year. Hmm. Well, I'm a little bit chagrined, actually, to uh, think that whenever I talk with you, Danny, or for that matter, almost anybody, it turns into a session of fear porn, because as I observe things around me, everything looks pretty scary and gloomy. Yes, I know the stock market is close to its all time highs and the bond market has recovered somewhat, but um, that's not what I'm talking about. What really concerns me, and of course, out here on the farm, I have a lot of time to do more reading than I might other places. And what I'm really concerned about is the continuing, and I've got to say accelerating, uh, degradation, uh, even collapse, of Western civilization. And that's much more important than where the stock market is, or for that well, matter, where the gold price is. Absolutely, absolutely agree with you. And I think that's a great segue um, into my talking point here regarding uh, the glitzy financial event that we all know that wrapped Davos. <laughs> and Argentina's Malay. Hmm. Um, Wall Street Journal has this headline, Argentina's Malay gives the Davos crowd a spine transplant. He warns the elites what can happen if the West stays on today's socialist path of servitude. He said leaders at Davos, he urged leaders at Davos to reject socialism and instead embrace free enterprise capitalism to end world poverty. Quote, today I'm here to tell you that the Western world is in danger. Klaus Schwab's eyes opening up this wide, Doug. What do you make of Malay's first overseas tour since taking office last month and um, his remarks at Davos? They were left speechless. Well, I am really proud of Malay. Uh, a lot of people are saying, ah, he's just going to be another false start. He's just going to be another guy that uh, talks the talk but isn't going to walk the walk. But it's pretty clear to me that that's not the case. I've always... Uh, from when he first appeared upon the scene, I have always been a believer that he was sincere. He actually understands uh, libertarian principles. He understands Austrian economics, uh, and he does walk the walk. The things that he's done just in the short period that he's been president, uh, abolishing uh, seven or eight uh, uh, agencies of the Argentine government, firing their top officials, not just redeploying them to uh, different bureaucracies. Uh, look, when he flew to the WEF, which of course right. makes you suspicious, why would any decent person want to go to the WEF? Uh, unlike the previous president of Argentina, who went in a, a government plane with an entourage, uh, Malay flew commercial uh, with only three or four uh, associates to it. And the speech he gave was, uh, it was like when you're dealing with a jackass. They say that when you're trying to teach a jackass something, the first thing you have to do is hit it between the eyes with a two by four to get its attention. And that speech he gave, which everybody should listen to, mm -hmm. uh, once, twice, three times, and then read it, it was perfectly 100% sound. And giving it to that hostile audience, 
uh, was an act of courage because these people actually are the enemy. Uh, and it was wonderful that he used words like parasites uh, in referring to his audience. So uh, he's off to a very good start. It's going to be a, ro a rocky road here in Argentina, but uh, still. Well, well, speaking of, let's just talk about Argentina. Two things here. Um, he pulled out of wanting to be part of the BRICS. Do you think that was a good move? And 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 let's talk about the devaluing of the peso there as part of his emergency economic reforms. Is is that's what's absolutely needed? So two things. Do you agree with pulling out of the BRICS and what he's doing to the peso? Well, look, the BRICS, like the UN and the IMF and the OECD, these are all just clubs for. Uh, corrupt and overly empowered government officials, mm -hmm. where they get to come together and eat expensive hors d'oeuvres and uh, <laughs> pretend that they're big deals. So from that point of view, yeah, uh, Argentina doesn't need the BRICS. Uh, his attitude is basically that of um, Thomas Jefferson. Uh, be a friend to all, but an ally of none. Uh, mm -hmm. His job as president of Argentina is to make Argentina free, which it's not really, prosperous, which it's definitely not, uh, and uh, keep it out of wars. Uh, and that's, that's his intention. So he doesn't need to join the BRICS for, for that because when you join the BRICS, I presume that that's going to imply certain things that he's going to have to do, certain policies he's going to have to adopt. They're all status policies where governments work together, but he doesn't believe in government as an entity. So uh, friend to all, ally the, to none, and so, you don't have to be a joiner, so. And on the topic of the peso, I mean, how is that impacting lives of the people? Well, the peso has negatively affected the lives of the Argentine people ever since the 1930s, when, the pay, when, when Argentina had gold coins and people used them in day-to-day -day commerce. And since then, Argentina has suffered one runaway inflation after another. So the Argentine peso is the enemy of the average Argentine. It makes a highly inflated currency, or for that matter, a currency that's inflated at all, makes it uneconomic and impossible for the average guy to save. And if you can't save, you can't get ahead. Uh, and the fact that the, uh, the peso is evaporating means that the guys at the bottom can't save, can't get ahead. And that, that's why this country has gone from being one of the richest in the world 100 years ago to one of the most impoverished in the world. So uh, we don't need the peso in Argentina. We don't need the central bank in Argentina. We, we just, and, and he said, use anything you want as a currency. Use Bitcoin, use the dollar if you want. And the ultimate, the ultimate object is he hopes to reinstitute gold as the day-to-day uh, -day currency in Argentina. Yes, yes. Um, and we're gonna talk more about that, more about gold later, but um, one more point from Davos because it's a, in a setting they usually dominate, top Biden administration officials and US lawmakers found themselves dug in an unusual position on the defensive crouch. And here I'm quoting an article from Politico. They said, day after day, the officials face questions about the political tussle over providing more aid to Ukraine, congressional polarization, the optics of supporting Israel despite the suffering of Palestinians and a growing bombing campaign against the Houthis in Yemen. And day after day, they had to reassure foreign counterparts that the U.S. had everything under control and that these were complicated times, but nothing America and its allies, allies couldn't handle. So do U.S. feeling the pressure at Davos, um, thoughts, thoughts on this, on, on the U.S. versus rest of the world optics right now? Hmm. Well, since the American people uh, maybe elected Biden. I don't think so. I, I'm personally of the opinion that the election really was stolen uh, by, by the Democrats. Absolutely everything that Washington has done has been counterproductive. In fact, worse than counterproductive, often the opposite of what they should be doing. Uh, 
Washington DC has been captured by Jacobins. These are the same people that uh, captured the French government after the revolution and turned it into a police state. These people share the same philosophy as the Bolsheviks that uh, took over Russia in 1917. They're, they have the same psychological makeup as the Chinese had during the Great Cultural Revolution. These are horrible, dangerous people. So every policy of Washington is the wrong policy. From supporting Ukraine, uh, notoriously the most uh, corrupt country uh, in, in Europe, and we can go into a whole separate conversation about who's right and who's wrong, but it, it it's actually makes no difference. It, it's a border war between two shithole countries and yeah, none of our business. What do you make of the pushback from some experts who say it's the greatest uh, a, a dividend that you, the America will ever receive funding to Ukraine because they're fighting the fight against Russia? <laughs> Look, the, the fact of the matter is that Russia is really not a danger to anyone at this point. Uh, it's, it's being constructed out of whole cloth as, as, a, as the enemy of freedom. And, and the fact is that for all the problems that, uh, that Putin has, and if you're going to rise high in any political order, you kind of have to be a bad guy you wind up doing nasty things. This is true of the head of state of every government in the world today. Putin is actually no worse than most. In fact, he's better than most of the uh, uh, criminal class, the parasites that, that run Europe. Uh, so uh, I know I'm going to alienate a lot, of, uh, a lot of your listeners who probably tune in to CNN and MSNBC to get their, so. daily, their daily two minutes of hate, as Orwell would have said, or indoctrination. But uh, Putin is not the bad guy. If you actually read his speeches, uh, they sound to me much better than any of the speeches that the Western politicians are giving. So I, I, I can lay out the whole reason why, although we should have nothing to do with it, it's not our problem that uh, believe it or not, and I'm not defending invading uh, the Ukraine. That was a strategic error on, on Putin's part, but uh, all things considered, he's kind of the good guy in this thing, but. Yeah, I, I wanna talk, I wanna talk the election now because uh, I believe you've said in other interviews, you think, you think the Democrats will take this election. I do, <laughs> I wrote an article in um, 2016, um, predicting that Trump would win. But um, then I wrote another article in 2020 that predicted that Biden would win. Uh, the reason I predicted that, uh, there were a number of reasons for it, six reasons why I thought that Biden would win. But not least of them was the, uh, was the COVID scandemic, which is, uh, <laughs> In addition to being a, a disaster, it's almost totally artificial. Uh, but one of the major reasons is the Democrats are much, much better at cheating than the Republicans are. Not that I think the Republicans are good guys, but they're not nearly as corrupt uh, to the core as the Democrats are these days. So uh, the Democrats won by cheating, and I suspect that as practiced at it as they are, that uh, they'll win again in 2020. Not to mention the fact that they've been actively promoting wokeism, which is a whole panoply of ideas, whole panoply of ideas that are related, that uh, are generally accepted by most, dare I say, of the American people these days. So um, yeah, the Democrats have control of the apparatus of the state and they want to maintain control of it, and they'll do anything that they can to uh, to do so. So I'm um, hence the law endless lawsuits against Trump. That's one thing they want to bank. They want to bankrupt him personally. They think that these lawsuits, and of course the average person doesn't know anything other than what he hears. So he thinks, well, where there's smoke, there must be fire. But these lawsuits are all 
total uh, and complete bullshit. They're um, harassment. It's it's lawfare. And, and let me underline the fact I'm not really a fan of Trump. Uh, I like the fact that he's a cultural conservative. He wants to maintain what's left of American civilization. Gut feeling. He doesn't have a philosophical center, so to speak, but his gut feelings are kind of good. His economic policies are misdirected. Uh, you know, he's an, he believes in printing money, but for good things that he believes in. He believes in putting on uh, uh, tariffs where he thinks it's a good idea. It's always a bad idea. So lots of things like that. But considering the alternatives, yeah, Trump is going to be much better than anybody the Democrats put up. Although I hasten to say, chances are, I'd say, approach zero that Biden is actually going to run for president. Who 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 steps in? <laughs> yeah, everybody's been asking themselves that question. Will it be Michelle Obama? Uh, people have said, well, will it be Oprah Winfrey? Uh, better a black woman, of course, in, 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 in today's world. I don't know who the Democrats will put up. Maybe, listen, there's no guarantee that we'll have an election. Maybe uh, the situation will get so serious yeah. with war abroad yes. that, that yes. they'll put off the election. Yes. Anything's let's, possible today. Let's, let's, let's go there. I, I, I really hope I can get through everything I want to touch on with you. I'm just, like I said, so excited to speak with you. So, um, Let's go there. Okay. Like, I guess, continuing along that thread of your assessment of Biden's handling of foreign affairs, let's talk about Doug Casey's views on the Middle East and how bad things could get. Because right now it's still happening over there. We don't have to care about it yet. It's not affecting our day to day yet. But what are the, how high are the risks that it starts spilling over, Doug? Uh, they're very high, uh, actually. Uh, the uh, dust up in the, in the Ukraine, um, and incidentally, I still call it the Ukraine, which was its official name since the country was given, was created by Lenin in 1923. Uh, it's been transformed into Ukraine. So I've still use the old the old name of the country. Uh, that's kind of faded into the background. Um, the big thing now is what's going on between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Uh, first thing, it's none of our business, frankly. I mean, it's very unfortunate. And I'm sympathetic to both sides. I think I understand the rationale that both sides have for feeling that they're right, okay? Uh, but it's not up to us to decide who's right and who's wrong. But these things tend to spin out of control because there are, there are a lot of dangerous criminal personalities in the U.S. Congress that actually want to bomb Iran. Uh, shades of, uh, who was that horrible senator that subsequently died that ran for president with an Irish name? <laughs> He's got a daughter who's almost as bad as he was. Anyway. Uh, yes, it could turn into a war against Iran. And then this thing with the Houthis. Oh, McCain. Yes, John McCain. Nobody had heard of the Houthis uh, six months ago. I mean, uh, or even heard of Yemen six months ago. But it's at a, a strategic juncture to the uh, entrance to the Red Sea. So why are the Houthis launching missiles against boats? Well, the reason is they support the Palestinians. They're of the opinion that the Israelis are committing a genocide against the Palestinians. I don't want to get into that. It's none of our business. Uh, in fact, when it comes right down to it, even though there's a lot of problems with this view, I'm on the Israeli side of this uh, because they're the only uh, outpost of Western civilization, such as, such as it is in the Middle East. Um, but um, the reason the Houthis are attacking boats is because they're, they're trying to fight on the, on, on the Palestinian side of this by denying trade to the Israelis. So that's the problem. And the U.S. getting involved in it and bombing the Houthis, I mean, it's really a war crime. 
Nobody's, uh, they haven't declared war against the U.S. The U.S. hasn't declared war against them. Uh, but we're just promiscuously flying planes in there and killing lots of Yemenis. Uh, it's, it, it's actually uh, an aggressive war crime uh, that, that we're doing. And, and nobody talks about that because I, I guess we're always on the right side of things. It's, it's none of our business. And, and now the Houthis, Biden hope, looking to place them on a terrorist watch list here. They took them off the list and now they're back on the list. Uh, look, the way this is probably going to wind up, uh, yeah. because um, weapons, especially missiles, have been democratized uh, in the last several decades. And it's at this point, military sources say that the Houthis uh, and of course, it wasn't so long ago, it used to be North Yemen and South Yemen. And we don't have to get into all that, but the Houthis are the old North Yemen uh, that were joined together and they should, probably should fall apart. They have a civil war going on in that country between the North and the South, which is another thing. It's always a bad idea to take sides in somebody else's civil war. But the fact is that they have thousands of these missiles uh, that they're launching. now. At some point, they're going to launch enough of them at one time and overcome U.S. defenses of whatever ships we have there, and they're going to really damage, God forbid, sink uh, a U.S. Uh, warship there. Mm -hmm. Then what's right. the U.S. going to do? So, yeah, this yeah. can really spin out of control. Right. Right. Um, okay. Another talking point on, well, I was kind of surprised to see this. I said, wow, could this really be part of, become part of the campaign trail? I know Vivek um, had, had brought up central bank digital currencies, but now during a campaign speech in New Hampshire, uh, former President Donald Trump vowed to prevent the creation of a U.S. central bank digital currency if re-electing it, calling it a dangerous threat to freedom. He warned that the central bank digital currency would give the government absolute control over your money and the ability to seize funds without individual's knowledge. When I saw this, thought, my first thought was, wow, I was just more shocked that we're, talk we're talking about central bank digital currencies. And obviously, I I'm, I'm happy about it because I want folks to be educated on central bank digital currencies. Uh, your take? Well, today in the West, when we buy things, we almost always use credit cards these days. And in China, Sweden, other countries, they really don't even use credit cards anymore. They use their smartphones. So the next step up for convenience is to totally digitize the dollar and have the dollar clear through the, federal, through the central bank. Now, when that happens, it means that the government the Federal Reserve, and in many ways they're the same thing, uh, will know everything that you buy and all sources of your income, and they'll have all of your savings, and it'll all, it's all going to be held in, in not even a piece of paper, which is at least is something that can be private and discreet. Everything, when everything is done by central bank digital currencies, they'll know everything about you. And if you're politically incorrect, like the Canadian truckers were recently, where the Canadian government was actually reaching into their personal bank accounts and penalizing them. So the, yeah. same thing, the same thing can happen. Digital currencies are a disastrous idea. If, listen, if you want to use your cell phone, uh, you should learn to use Bitcoin uh to buy and sell things and of course most merchants won't want to take bitcoin because they're not familiar with it but that's a solution it's not to centralize things more and give more power to the state which is what these cbdc's are going to do they're a complete disaster can we can we stop them i mean christine La christine lagarde on new year's eve i remember opening twitter and seeing her message or on new year's day 25th anniversary of the euro we're so excited look for a, a digital version of the euro coming soon. Obviously, you know, constructing a narrative of, of this is something celebratory. <laughs> um, so it seems that this train can't be stopped. Yeah, it's almost taken on a life of its own. It, it really has at this point. 
And since these people control the apparatus of the state, they're able to enforce these things on society, and most people go along with it. Uh, look, saying the kind of things that I'm saying doesn't do me any good personally. It's like a, a flock of chickens. If you're the chicken in the flock that's got a feather that's out of order, all the other chickens will attack you. And that's what happens. The, the flock has totally been captured by the wokus at this point. So I'm not doing myself any good by saying these things, but uh, it amuses what, what, me. And what do you think, well, sorry. And, and I like to feel that I'm doing the good thing. Of course, these people actually are so bent that they feel what they're doing is the good thing. It's a basic, it's a basic dichotomy of ethics, of what you think is right and wrong, good and evil. Uh, that's what it's coming down to. It's not, it's not just a question of, is it convenient or uh, will it work or will it add to the GNP or subtract from the DNP? It's a question of uh, something much more basic than that. Uh, the whole nature of man and, like I said, what's right, what's wrong, good and evil. That's, that's, this is just an application of that. It, it, that it will be interesting. I feel there's no shortage of, I mean, it will be interesting to see the issues that are really going to be speaking to Americans' hearts that, you know, that we'll see on uh, come the election. I mean, you know, is it going to be uh, the U.S.'s handling of, of, of the Middle East, Middle Eastern war? Is it going to be America's continuous funding to Ukraine? You know, Mike Johnson now talking, floating the idea of let's freeze Russian assets to pay for the Ukrainian war. And we didn't even touch upon uh, uh, my, the my, mass migration, Doug. Mass yeah. migration. I mean, why are there sanctuary cities and how were they ever, like, why is New York a sanctuary city? Why does the average American have to, in effect, put anybody that walks across the border, and generally speaking, they're not people that know anything about American values or share any ideas of American history or philosophy or what made America different and better than any other country in the world. So we have to put all these people on welfare, which is exactly the wrong signal to send to them. I mean, nothing wrong with immigrants. I'm actually all for immigrants. But when people immigrated here to the U.S. 100 years ago, they had to make it on their own. There was zero welfare. They got That's zero right. support from the government. They had to make it on their own. That's not the case with this, this new class of people that are being given money, given cell phones, given places to live. Uh, we're, in effect, importing a time bomb since we don't know who these people are, except for the fact that they don't share any basic American values. Well, this, this, this could all be solved. You know, you can't have a welfare, you, you can't have free immigration when you have a welfare state. Because when you have a welfare state, you attract the worst kind of people, people that are looking for something for nothing. In California, now, they want to officially allow free medical care to anybody and everybody, regardless of their status. So if I was a, a poor Venezuelan or a poor Nigerian or whoever it is, absolutely, I'd try to get to the U.S. as soon as possible and get on the, the gravy train. Uh, Doug Casey, I, I, I guess my question is, I know you're out in Uruguay right now, um, but I see so many people thinking, you know, that they need a plan B during these times. I mean, do you think that's what we all should be doing is thinking of, do we all need a getaway plan and need to be investing in, you know, in things such as gold and things considered outside the system? I mean, how should we be preparing for everything that we have to face here? Well, your biggest risk in the world, the financial risks in the world today are huge. Uh, stock market, bond market, real estate market, all of these things are um, very, very risky today, built upon a gigantic and growing pyramid of debt, which could collapse. Uh, so your financial risks are huge today, but your political risks are even larger. Uh, so what you have to do, just as you diversify financially, you should diversify politically. Now, how do you do that? Uh, mm -hmm. You do that by having a 
if you can afford it, and I hope you're in a position to do so, if you're not, uh, put yourself in a position to do so, you should have a second residence abroad in a stable country that you enjoy, uh, preferably a second citizenship abroad because your U.S. passport is not your possession. It's the possession of the U.S. government. It says it right on the passport. And they can cancel it electronically uh, for any number of reasons. And they have done that with people uh, increasingly. They're doing it today. So that's the first thing you want to do. Politically diversify in a different and more stable foreign environment. That's number one. And within the U.S. and in your second or third foreign country, uh, make sure your investments are in the right place. Now, I favor gold. I've favored gold for a long time, uh, since the early 1970s. Shameful to say that I'm old enough to be able to make that statement. But um, it's treated me very well. Uh, over the years, it's gone up about, let me see, from $40 to $2,000. It's gone up 50 times, which is... Not bad for a savings vehicle, and that's what I see gold as. It's the only financial asset that's not simultaneously somebody else's liability. You can have it in your own palm. So gold is the basis of it. And then beyond that, I think you have to learn to speculate because the financial markets are going to be going up and down like an elevator with a lunatic at the controls, which is actually a, a, a very good analogy for what's going on. Um, it is. To, to try to stay ahead of the uh, debasement of the currency. Because the U.S. is getting poorer now and printing up more money, which they're doing by the trillions at this point, is not going to make it poorer. It's going to, it, richer, it's going to make it poorer, except for the people that are connected in Washington and New York. They're getting richer at an accelerating rate. So we're looking at class warfare Maybe even something resembling a civil war, not like the one, not like the unpleasantness that we had from 1861 to 65. This will be different this time, but it's a very unstable situation. I appreciate you outlining these real dangers, and not. I, I just chuckled myself when I saw the Economist headline: Donald Trump poses the biggest danger to the world in 2024. Um, no, the, the reason the average guy supports him is because Donald Trump is. For all his problems, and there are plenty of them, uh, uh, he's trying to push back against the globalists, the type of people that show up at the World Economic Forum. And, uh, you know, there are, there are good things happening in the world. For instance, Argentina, which is only about one cycle ahead of the U.S. in, uh, in sliding towards the sewer, the average person in Argentina, especially young people who are being hurt worst, uh, decided we've got to get rid of these criminals. And that's why they elected Millet, who is uh, totally sound. And once again, I urge people to Google Millet's speech to the WEF. And uh, this was courageous on his part, you know, telling uh, the international criminal class, who are very powerful, uh, exactly what he thinks of them and what should be done. Um, last question to you, Doug, because I know you spoke of the dangers of wokeism, and I know I'm going to get questions of, well, what's Doug's definition of wokeism? Because the term woke has been so distorted and people have different definitions. But for you, what does it mean to be if one is woke? It means that you accept uh, this moral code that has been subtly imposed and slowly imposed over the years and has now blossomed. Uh, it means that you don't believe in free speech unless it's very politically correct and accepted. You don't believe in free thought. Uh, you don't believe in entrepreneurialism. You think that, uh, in fact, you probably believe in a guaranteed annual income. Uh, it, it, believe, it, it means that you believe in the government as opposed to the individual. It, it means that the whole moral basis, the whole ethical basis of, uh, of your philosophy has been corrupted with these collectivist ideas. It means that uh, you see everybody as either a member of the oppressor class or the oppressed class, one or mm -hmm. the other. Talk about uh, dividing society into two. <laughs> uh, 
So exactly. it's uh, it, it, it's a very, very dangerous uh, thing. And it shouldn't be countenanced. It shouldn't be accepted by saying, oh, well, they have good intentions and they're trying to do the right thing. No, these people are either stupid or they're actually evil, which means that they are actively destructive. What do they want to destroy? They want to destroy all of the values that made America different and great. In fact, all the values that started with ancient Greek civilization of critical thinking that make Western civilization uh, far and away superior to any other civilization in world history. They really want to wash away all these things. Now, I'm not a mm -hmm. traditionalist, but you know, no, I like to not. look at things and <laughs> I'd like to keep what's good and throw, it, throw out what's bad. And that means throwing out socialism and communism and fascism, which is actually the reigning ideology in the world today. It has nothing to do with jackboots and black uniforms, incidentally. It's an economic system, the melding of the state with corporations. Uh, and people think it's capitalism because corporations are involved. No, it's got nothing to do with that. Fascism, incidentally, was a word that was coined by Mussolini, a partnership between the state and corporations. So um, no, he wants to, we want to throw out all those things and go back to uh, uh, individual freedom and uh, capitalism. Doug Casey, you are a, a gem and I thank you for this episode in critical thinking. And um, well, at the moment, Daniela, we're at the moment, Daniela, we're on the wrong side of history, or at least it appears that way. But um, I'm not going to uh, uh, be guilty of desertion in the face of the enemy. So somebody's got to say these things. And some people will listen to it and say, you know, that kind of makes sense. I ought to look into it further. Well, I appreciate you. I appreciate your time. Come back anytime. Doug Casey, thank you. Thanks, Danielle. And thank you all for watching. We'll have more great content coming your way on the Daniela Camboni Show. Don't forget, you can sign up at DanielaCambone.com. That's it for me. Thanks for watching.